This is Podcast Radio's countdown of the top 20 podcasts in the world right now, based on downloads and your recommendations at thepodcastradio.co.uk. Each week, I'll be... Dom, is that your phone again? Hello? Oh, no, I'm on with Graham Mack. No ideas, rubbish. Checking in on Zoom, it's Piper Terrett from the Lockdown Lowdown podcast. Last week, we spoke about how I was getting into recording audio books. My new gig as an audio book narrator. Oh, yeah. How's the audio book going? How far have you got? Well, I finished the first one. Mm. My biggest worry with the audio books is the neighbours at the minute. Neighbours? Yeah, because I'm doing them in here, which is the... Actually, this is supposed to be the master bedroom, but when you buy a new flat, you know, a large wardrobe is known as the master bedroom. Behind that wall just there is the neighbour's bedroom. Ah. And I'm doing these, you know, that, that last one I told you about the battle scenes. Yeah. You know, come on, you bloody bastards! And I mean, <laughs> I'm getting right into it. It's bayonets and whatever. <laughs> But there was an awkward sex scene in a temple. <laughs> in a temple? Uh, in a temple, yeah, an oh, Indian dear. temple. And, you know, there's, you know, there's all that. And I'm, I have to play both parts. And, like, <laughs> 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 what they must be thinking. <laughs> Sean Williamson, you'll know him as Barry from EastEnders. In 2017, you went on Celebrity Big Brother. Why did you do that? Tax bill. Was it? it? Really? It was a tax bill? I mean, let's be honest. Let's be honest. If you see an actor of any calibre on there, it's got to be a tax bill. It has to be. I was lucky because I, I, I'd watched it. I'd always watched it and I'd experienced other people's discomfort and there have been some real creatures on there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Perez Hilton, I don't care calling him a creature, you know, and um, someone called Bear and do you know what I mean? And, and, yeah. and they were real wind, proper wind-up merchants. Yeah. And they'd force several people to leave as opposed to, you know, people were going to hit them and saying, I've got to go, otherwise I'll assault you. Yeah. So I thought, oh, no one going to make me do that. And I was lucky. The youngsters gave me a, a, a fair bit of respect, actually. They weren't a bad lot at all. And uh, there was a, the late Derek Akora was in there. How Unlike did you get on with, with Derek Akora? They were desperate because we ended up friends. So they were desperate in, in the diary room for me to say he was a fraud. Oh, were I they? I just ended up saying... I believe Derek believes everything he sees and feels, and yeah. that's it. Yeah, because I've always wanted. I, I mean, he's gone now. He's he, but I always wanted to ask him why he only gets possessed by Scouse ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Graham Mack, and my guest is Alan Alder. Your podcast is called Clear and Vivid. What podcast do you listen to, Alan? I have I have so little time because of the work I do. I don't listen to many podcasts. I listen I, I some science podcasts. In our country, we have a radio show called Science Friday, and I like that a lot. I don't listen to many. What podcasts do you listen to? I listen to, I like Mark Maron because it's a long-form interview with one of his guests. Yeah, I, 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 he interviewed me and I interviewed him. And he does the same thing. He goes for a conversation. Yeah. I never saw him look at a note while we were talking. He probably had a few things in mind he wanted to talk about. Yeah. But mostly it, it, the conversation happened because things evolved. Yeah. And one of the best podcasts I ever heard was Mark Marin interviewing o a Barack Obama. Yeah, in his garage. <laughs> in his garage. Yeah. And I had never heard Obama be so available before, so unaware that he was the president. Yeah. He was a smart, funny person who could play with Mark Maron. Yeah. He, it's funny. He, I, As I remember, the book you were talking about before, Never Have Your Dog Stuff. Yeah. It's either that or my second book. I can't remember. I was nominated for a Grammy for reading the book on audio, and so was Barack Obama for his book, and of course he won and I listened and I knew he would because I listened to his reading. It was fantastic. Talk about playing characters. He could play a variety of people and sound like someone else, but with the attitude 
not just the uh, not just the accent. So are you telling me that a world famous actor and a man who trains people how to act was beaten by an amateur? He's hardly an amateur. <laughs> He doesn't have the experience and, and the uh, the credentials that you do, though, does he? He's been on more television shows than I have in my whole life. <laughs> and I suppose he's played a variety of roles as well, because uh, being the president, you have to... Who was it said to be the president? You have to be a cold-blooded killer. You have to be able to order the attack on the the garrison and then go to the cocktail party. Right, and then go to the survivors when... The yeah. After, after you take off your tux. Yeah. I never have understood because so much of that is true. I've never understood why so many people want to be president. Yeah. The former Newsnight presenter, Gavin Esler, in 2012, you published a book called Lessons from the Top, How Leaders Succeed Through the Power of Stories. What are these stories and why are they so important? What happened was I was trying to think. I'd met so many, lead, uh, you know, uh, Blair, Clinton, Thatcher, Angela Merkel, Dolly Parton, who features quite heavily in the book because she's a great storyteller. Lots and lots of people. And I tried to figure out how is it that some people connect and some people don't. I mean, there's some, there's some very bright people who go into politics and they don't quite connect with uh, the general public. And I realized that there's three basic stories and every single one of the successful leaders tell those same three stories. And they are, who am I as a person? Who are we as a group? And then if you're still listening, they can tell you where we're going with this, what, what that leader is gonna do. So for example, Mrs. Thatcher, I'm just the grocer's daughter from Grantham. Bill Clinton, I'm the boy from Hope. And uh, Donald Trump, I'm the greatest billionaire business person in the entire world. Now, this can be entirely fictitious, but it's always only part of the story. I mean, Mrs. Thatcher was many more things than the grocer's daughter from Grantham, but that's the story she wanted to tell. Bill Clinton, when I first bumped into him, and literally bumped into him, he was out jogging, he said, I'm just the boy from Hope, Hope, Arkansas being the town that he came from. Now, there's many other things you could say about these leaders, but that's the one little nugget they wanted to get in your brain. And then where, who are we? Well, you know, Mrs. Thatcher redefined both the Conservative Party and the country and Bill Clinton. You know, we're not the old Democrats. We are the new Democrats. And Tony Blair did the same thing and others. And then if you're still listening, as I say, you might listen to their policies. And one of the problems with some politicians who lose, Hillary Clinton's one, Ed Miliband's another, whatever the greatness or otherwise of the policies, the, the third bit, if they haven't really sold you the idea of who they are in a way that you like, everybody knew who Hillary Clinton was, but she was very divisive and many people didn't like her. I, don't, I personally don't think people really knew who Ed Miliband was. I mean, he's a very bright, bright guy. Maybe he would have been a good prime minister or a bad prime minister. But nobody listened to his 300 policies or whatever they were until he properly connected. And so that, that's what the book's about. Uh, as a result of that book, I continue to do lots of speaking to businesses in particular because a lot of businesses are trying to figure out what their identity actually is. And quite often the chief executives want to discuss that as well because all leadership positions are quite difficult. And people in business have very much woken up to the fact that just to be able to do a good job isn't good enough. I mean, one of the things I say, and this, this came from a, from a banker, uh, a CEO of a major bank who I was discussing this with. He asked me to come in and chat to him. And he said, oh, he said, I get it. I get it. Um, if hard skills were everything, then Spock would have been commander of the USS Enterprise. <laughs> and I said, Brilliant. that's great. I'm going to put that in the, I'm going to put that in the book the next time I rewrite it. <laughs> Alan Alder. Alan, you played Hawkeye Pierce on MASH for 11 seasons. How about censorship back then? Because it started in 72. Did that change as the series yes. went along? Could you get away with a lot more? Yes. It turns out that forbidden words are not so forbidden if you're really popular. <laughs> <laughs> Which is counterintuitive. You think you'd be able to get a, away with more when, when hardly anybody's watching it, wouldn't you? When nobody's listening, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... In one of the first few shows, Radar had a line in which he said, uh, I, I don't know about that, sir. I'm a virgin at that. With no sexual meaning. It just meant he was unfamiliar with the subject. 
the censor said, you can't say the word virgin. So Larry Gelbart, the head writer, was really upset at that. So he wrote a line in the next show that he knew they couldn't take out. I say to a kid on a stretcher, where are you from, son? He says, the Virgin Islands, sir. <laughs> Did it become a bit of a game then to see what you could get in? It w was a, a morbid game because sometimes you needed the, the juice, the sauce of a word that really has no, no repugnance to it. It's common talk. But they, they were fastidious. I mean, so fastidious that in one show, there's, it's the show that I wrote, there was a jock strap on a table. Do you use that word over there, jock yeah, strap? Yeah, we, we know what that is, yeah. Okay. So Loretta comes into the, uh, Margaret comes into the tent and sees it and says, how dare you parade that thing before me? Well, the centers were more fastidious than she was. They said, not only can you not have a jockstrap, you can't even have a white piece of cloth representing a jockstrap. On the, now, now, this, this to, to show the sexism at the same time of the rampant uh, censorship, in many shows I had walked through clotheslines, or the equivalent shot of this, walking through clotheslines filled with women's brassiers and panties. <laughs> But a man's intimate apparel is somehow sacred, and you can't show that. That's, that's forbidden. So the whole thing was silly. The funniest story I heard about censorship on MASH, and maybe you can confirm whether it's true or not. I'll tell you where I heard it. You know Ken Levine, one of the writers on yeah, MASH? He has a sure. great podcast called Hollywood and Levine. And he told this story about apparently there was a, a visiting general or something, and the colonel said, uh, take this man to the VIP tent. And the line was supposed to be, Radar was supposed to say, right this way, your vip -ness. Uh, and that, and that they was, got I, it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know about that. Which I think should be fine because, first of all, penis isn't a swear word. And secondly, if kids are so young they don't know what it means, they're not even going to hear it. They'll write this way, your VI penis. So it just shows how touchy they, they, they could have been. So you, if, if he had said, write this way, your, your vagina, that would have been allowed. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Based on, the, on, on the, the precedent set over the jockstrap and the knickers, yeah. Well, let's go on Zoom now then and talk to Piper Terrett, the host of the Lockdown Lowdown podcast. Piper, I know you're a fan of the audio books that I narrate. You know, I've been looking at the list of books I can audition for. So many of them are dirty books. <laughs> you know okay. where the picture cover has got a woman with a cleavage and two muscular men? Kind of oh, I know exactly the kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I just don't think I'm comfortable with that kind of stuff. No. <laughs> well, the Darrington book went a little bit further. The really? One that, yeah. Spitfire. The, no, no, some, Spitfire. No. There's nothing in it. No, there's Spitfire. No, no, it didn't no, sound no. like in the no, care no. home. The, the no. Darrington book is the other one. The Darrington book is. is not much room in the Spitfire either. No. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's possible. I, I, I don't know. No. Let's not go there. But it's okay, not sorry. Sir joystick. Okay, let's no, get out sorry, of here. Okay. Not sir right. Joystick. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Chops away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, the Darrington book is what is known as a Regency romance. This was the okay. one where the bloke came back from the sea, the guy with the servants, and he was in Brighton. Oh, yes. I remember yeah. now. That yeah. one, towards the end, got a little graphic, but nothing. Oh, really? Well, yeah. they get together and, you know, uh, yeah. he, you know, the taffeta is, is, is ruffled. And... <laughs> <laughs> You know, I can see you squirming already. So the yeah, thought yeah. of having to do a the, 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 bo and... the bodice opened and um, he oh. ended up um, way An down unspill. there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. But there was, okay. but and that was as graphic as it got, which is fairly graphic in my <laughs> eyes. <laughs> yeah. So I did look at one yesterday, one of these erotic oh, ones, yeah. because they are paying a royalty share plus. And this one was some was in the top bestsellers, so it would yeah. sell as well because they have to do that because you're going to get the royalty share, and it was paying a royalty share plus. 
Yeah. And so I looked at the audition, and the audition was extremely graphic. Really? Okay. The language used, for instance, was... Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So... I don't know if I'm cut out for that kind of work. Yeah, is it is it sweary sweary yeah. language or is it anatomical? It, it's okay. sweary language to describe anatomical. See, see you and, next Tuesday, that sort of thing. I didn't see that word. Right. Okay. But there was there was the the f word was in there. Shocking. Yeah. But Oof. it was not used as an adjective. It was used as a description of a procedure. Right. Okay. I get you, you know what I mean. Yeah. Yes, and so oh, no, I don't know if I'm cut out for that. I just yeah, I know what you mean because you got you've got to well, you got to give your all to it. We've got to suspend the disbelief and yeah, and oh yeah, you've got to be. And, so yeah. I did have a thought in the night, but I'm not sure if I want to go this way. Mm. You because one of my issues is yeah, if I do a kids book, which I want <laughs> to do the kids books, I do <laughs> want to do the kids books, right? Yeah, yeah, you're gonna yeah, and you wear my tight name. Cup. My name is on the cover of the book. Yeah, I see so, your dilemma. So, so yeah. But mm. there is an option, but I oh. still don't know if I'm ready for it. You don't have to give your real name. You can make up an, a, a pseudonym. Pseudonym, yeah. So I could, have a, I could have a porn star name. <laughs> <laughs> so just, what, have you got an, just what would it be? Kind of work? What well, would the, it be? Well, I don't know. I haven't... Big Mac or that. something. I don't know. I, I, um, <laughs> I haven't thought that deeply, but that's what you do, isn't it? <laughs> well, didn't it used to be the name of your first pet and then the street you grew up in? Or, I can't remember. It something was like something that, like, that, it? like that. There is a rule to it, isn't there? <sighs> yeah. So, you... so that's an option, but I still don't know. What do you think? Because mm. I'd still have to do it. You would have to do it, yeah. You would have to do it. <laughs> no, that, I don't. I think I. You just start laughing. That's yeah, I know funny. that. There's part of that, and part of it's like really uncomfortable. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. So I just because I think yeah. that would be a problem as well if you did get known for narrating. You go like, oh, this guy always because I pick the books yeah. that I do. They go, oh, this guy always picks a good book. If then all of what is it that Dennis Norden said? It would be like seeing Santa eating venison. <laughs> Dom Jolly he was made famous by Trigger Happy TV on Channel 4 after that Dom you went to the BBC but it didn't work out did it I, I went to the BBC and I started making this show called 100 Things Do Before You Die and the idea was it was like one of those shows but it was like the wrong person had been given the show so instead of parachute jumping i'd lock myself in a fridge and see whether the light went out when the door closed it was like a weird thing and we started making it and i was really chuffed with it It was for bbc2 and i pitched this at channel 4 before i left and they liked it all the people at channel 4 left and went to channel 5 and i'm halfway through making the show i opened the guardian and uh, it said channel 5 september list 100 things to do before you die and the f***ers had just nicked it totally and they put it out before mine so i had to go to bbc2 and say you know what uh, they've nicked it and they've done it, so I, I have to cancel. And we were halfway through the show and they said, well, just carry on. And I said, no, they've done it already and it's different. Anyway, it was a nightmare. So that got me a reputation at the BBC for being tricky. So I had to sort of stop and then I launched BBC Three with a fake chat show and I called it This Is Dom Jolly, but I was wearing glasses and it was so obvious to me that it wasn't me. But everyone, what, I wanted 20% of the people to watch it to think, oh my God, Dom Jolly's a <laughs> and the other 80% to get the joke. <laughs> As it was, I think 80% of people watched it and went, God, he's a wanker. Because, you know, I was just, I was this sort of ego version of me. And I, it was it was clearly faked, but I don't know. Uh, but it had a lot of fun. Had lots of bands on it. I love how the Cure on, the Water Boys, Ian Brown. I mean, everyone, Granddaddy. It was fantastic fun. And then I thought I'd better cash in my chips because I knew the BBC were like, what is this guy doing? So I got a show for BBC One. So I made a kind of international trigger happy called World Shut Your Mouth, which is still my favourite show. <laughs> and I kicked off each show. I thought it'd be really funny. I flew round the world in one trip to all the seven wonders of the world, the Great Wall of China, the pyramids, uh, the Taj Mahal, just to stand in front of it and wait for someone to come up. And I'd go, oh, Taj Mahal. And they'd go, yeah. And i go, well, that is shit. <laughs> and that was it. That's all I did. And I thought that was the strongest... <laughs> 
purest <laughs> beginning. And honestly, when I handed it into the BBC, I could see them just thinking, this man has to leave the BBC. <laughs> so that was it. Your autobiography, Here Comes the Clown, came out in 2015. But, yeah. But 10 years before that, you did a spoof autobiography called Look At Me. Why did the parody one come first? It would seem like the natural person do a normal one and then parody that. Because someone, because when Trey Gappy was at its height, someone came to me and offered me a stupid amount of money to write my autobiography. And I'd always said, you should never write. I mean, Martine McCutcheon was on her third volumes of her autobiography at the age of about 23. And I was like, you really shouldn't write an autobiography till you're 50, as far as I'm concerned. I think Britney Spears wrote one before she'd had sex. I mean, how interesting could that have been? Well, I mean, none of these people write their books anyway, for a start. But anyway, so I, so I, I, they offered me a silly amount of money. I couldn't turn it down. And I thought, great, I'll do it. And then the moment I'd accepted, I thought, oh, I can't. Like, it's, I hate these sort of books. So then I thought, I'll do a pastiche there were, there were a lot of shit autobiographies out at the time. And I thought, I'll write a pastiche one. And then I started writing and it just segued into this weird thing where it sort of is my life, but it's not really. It's like, a, it's you know, I mean, page two, I had a talking dog. So it's pretty obviously not my life. But people were like, is this real? But actually it was like it was Lebanon and then a diplomat and stuff. And it went up to the moment I was famous, but in a sort of totally heightened it was though I was on acid I've no idea what that book is I'm quite proud of it actually now but it was weird and it absolutely so, died so you didn't murder your Armenian nanny and you weren't raped by a TV weather girl and it wasn't covered up uh there are a couple of things in there that did happen I did end up in a weird flat in Edinburgh with a guy that was a weather reporter and uh, was dancing with his Pekingese I didn't get raped obviously but um there, there are a lot of weird bits in it that are true I did uh, there's a Peter Mandelson story in there that's pretty close, and there's weird stuff, yeah. According to Wikipedia, you went to the same school as Osama bin Laden. Is that bit true? That is true, yeah. And that is, I mean, I, I talk about that on my uh, tour that has been rescheduled, but um, I did a show where I went off, it was called Excellent Adventure, and I was supposed to drive into Syria where I used to go as a kid from Lebanon. So I flew to Lebanon with a mate, and we were going to go on this road trip into Syria, but the director said, before we go be nice to see what it was like growing up in Lebanon. Let's go to your old school. So I went to my old school, which is called Brumana High School. And very weird, it's a Quaker school in the mountains above Beirut. And it was built by Quakers from Darlington in 1860. Like what they were doing there, I have no idea. But anyway, so I went there and I was filming in the in the grounds because I told I got a fixer and he'd said, yeah, yeah, we sorted it out. And this woman marches out, she's livid and she's the headmistress. And it turns out the fixer did what I would have done he just took the money and f***ed off. He didn't ask anyone. So she had no idea what we were doing. So she starts screaming at me, what are you doing here? And I go, I'm really sorry, we're making a documentary. And why? I go, well, because I went to school here. She goes, who gives a shit? So I was like, yeah, fair point. But I was like, to be honest, I think I'm probably one of your more famous alumni. And she looked at me and said, I don't think so. And I go, well, who's more? And she goes, Osama bin Laden. And I go, okay. <laughs> so then she panicked because it's a Quaker school. Can you imagine taking prospective parents round and going, uh, you know, Quakers are pacifists and saying, I don't know if you know about our most famous alumni, uh, Osama bin Laden. So they then denied it. And I tried to find a school photo of me and bin Laden because he was 16 and I was six. And this was 1974. Uh, so we were there together for a year. But obviously, I didn't know him. I didn't meet him. I, he didn't look like that at the time. The bin Ladens looked like the Partridge family back then. So, But yeah, I did. Right. So it's a shame you didn't get to know him because you could have maybe convinced him, you know, his life could have gone a different way. It's like these people who say that a time machine, they go back and kill baby Hitler or at least go back and tell him that his art was pretty good. You know, yeah. he could have changed the world. Yeah. So you... Or well, maybe it, I'd have joined Al-Qaeda. Who knows? Uh, you could have gone the other way. Yes, it could. It, yeah. it, it could have done. It's not good for me when I go to the States, though, because they look at my passport, born in Beirut. Then they look it up online. It says trigger happy, comedy terrorist, went scored... <laughs> With Bin Laden, I've got visas from Iran, North Korea, Congo. It's 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 not it's not a pleasant thing when I go to America. Yeah, especially in an airport if you tell them you're there to shoot a pilot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I want to give a nod to the journalist Piper Terrett. She's got a podcast out called The Lockdown Lowdown. Have you had anything embarrassing happen during lockdown? Embarrassing? No. I got some news this week that can only be described a, a, as a roller coaster of emotion. Oh, no. 
there is a fine line between comedy and tragedy. And my family in Liverpool straddle that line quite regularly. To give you a bit of background, currently, I'm, shall we say, disconnected from my close family. My sister hates me, and um, uh, in my mother's eyes, my sister can do no wrong, so oh, that's horrible. we have nothing to do with each other, because any time I've gone up there to, to have any time with either of them, I've ended up getting quite hurt, actually, so... I'm not disconnected, you know, to punish them or hurt them. I'm disconnected just to protect me because it's not pleasant. Now, my dad died in June last year. He was cremated and I didn't go to the funeral because I knew my sister was going to be there and I didn't want anything to kick off because all the, the extended family would have been there and there's really no words to describe the the intensity of the hatred that my sister has for me and and, and I didn't want that to to be the focus of the funeral yeah my dad and I didn't have what you would call a, a father son relationship oh. I never actually got the feeling that he even liked me but <laughs> that's a different thing yeah I never found him to be a a particular a role model. He was such a cheapskate. Really? Yeah. We weren't poor, but he would not spend money. Like, well, something is something as basic as um, as school shoes. Uh, most kids had school shoes. Yeah. I had steel toe capped work boots because he used to steal them from the site he worked on, and that's what <laughs> I went to school in. Oh God. <laughs> I know. Um, That's awful. Yeah. A anyway, I mean, he would know the price of, of every of the pint at, at, at every pub within a ten mile radius, and, and how much cheaper it was in the club that he went to. You know. Yeah. For my fortieth birthday, we were living in Bournemouth at the time, and uh, they came down to visit, and we went out for lunch at Frankie and Benny's, and he wouldn't order any food because the deal they were on in their hotel, they got a meal. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> So, yeah. you know. So anyway, but my extended family are lovely. Mm. And I, I've never felt anything other th than love and, and support. And they're wonderful. Mm. And this week, I, I got an email from my favorite auntie, my mum's sister, my auntie Hazel in Liverpool. She emailed me to say that her brother, my uncle Brian in Scotland, had died. Oh, no. And I was really quite upset when, when I found out because I really, really liked Uncle Brian. Yeah. I mean, he really was someone. I mean, he was an ex-Navy man. He was, you know, generous. And I can remember playing football. He'd come down from Scotland every now and again. It was a real treat yeah. when he'd show, you know. I can remember playing football in the back garden with him when I was about five. And it's funny, I have no memory of have playing football in the back garden with my father. No. But Uncle Brian died, you know, and there were tears and, and all the rest of it. And it was good because I realized that you know, I always wonder whether I'm normal. You know, I think that's the number one question a lot of people ask themselves is, am I normal? Yeah. When I found out that my dad had died, once again, it was also my Auntie Hazel that told me that my dad had died last June. I felt nothing. Like nothing. Not like, not anger or release or sadness or happiness. I actually, there was nothing. And at the time I was like, wow, there's something wrong with me. Your father dies. You're supposed to feel something really worried mm. and i googled it and i found that kids who didn't have a proper relationship with their father but always wanted one yeah desperately want you desperately want love and approval from from your father yeah. especially a boy of course you do. it turns out that you've actually been mourning them your whole life so when the moment comes that they die you you've you're over you've done it you've been through it yeah and i spoke to dom jolly about it on, on the podcast radio interview I did, and, and he had a similar thing. He said that he, he'd, he'd mourned him for 10 years before. I think I'd mourned my dad for a lot longer than that. So that made me feel okay. And then when I realized I was upset about Uncle Brian going, that, yeah, okay, I'm normal, <laughs> you know. So that was a bit of relief there that, you know, I'm not a, a Vulcan, you know. Yeah. There's, uh... 
So, so anyway, none of us are normal, Graham. That, this is this is the nobody thing. is normal. Nobody's, nobody's normal. normal. No. So, it's no such thing. So nobody's normal. It forced me to reply to my auntie Hazel to to thank her for telling me and to let her know that yeah, the message I'd got the message and I wrote some nice things about my uncle Brian. You know, when I was a kid, I was into space and I remember he took me to Jodrell Bank to see the radio telescope and a funny story is we were, he lived on the the island of Rothsay in Scotland, the Isle of Bute. Yeah. Rothsay, Isle of Bute in Scotland. And he used to run a cafe on the front there. Everybody in the town knew him. And we were out, it was a day out. There's a, there's a main ferry, the Weems Bay Ferry, but there's another ferry way out on the the the, the, the arse end of the island, I suppose. And uh, it's very rural at this other ferry. And we were there, I think we'd only gone there just to see the ferry. We weren't getting on it. We'd come across on it. Anyway, so we're waiting there. And it's, it's a rural Scottish island. Yeah. And there's a bloke rides up on a horse. I mean, this huge, beautiful brown horse. And I don't know, it was probably going on the ferry, the horse. I don't know. Yeah. Bloke rides up on a horse. And I'm standing there with Brian. And this other bloke starts walking towards us. And Brian says to me, he says, uh, this boy here, he's a, he's a really, really, really nice man. He said, but he's a bit simple. He's, uh, he's, he's touched, yeah. but uh, he's a lovely fella. But I just thought I'd let you know. And I'm okay. And I'm like, you know, 12 years old at this, you know, yeah. but he's letting me in. This bloke comes up and he says, hi, hey, Brian, how are you doing? You know, and then he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, fine, fine. He says, uh, that's a fine looking horse. That there. That's a, a beautiful horse. What breed of horse would that be, Brian? And without trying to be funny, with a total straight face, he turns to him and he goes, uh, I think that would be your, um, that's your red setter. <laughs> and this fella goes, a red setter, is that a fact? Hey, well, it's a fine looking red setter, so it is. <laughs> and I, I always wondered <laughs> whether this fella had like, you know, later that day had been in his local pub or something and he'd be talking to people and they know he's a bit that way. Yeah, and he would have said, oh, "I was at the ferry today, and a bloke rode by on a red setter." <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, that was Brian. Now I've I, I, I've opened a, a dialogue with my auntie Hazel, my mum's sister, and, and Brian was her brother. You know, so yeah, I've opened this dialogue. She replied to my email with some details of what's been going on with my mum and my sister because, you know, I'm disconnected from them. Yeah. And this sentence in particular jumped out. She says, Your dad is still on the shelf at The Undertaker's because no one has paid the bill for the funeral. What? Like I said, fine line between tragedy and comedy. Yes. Now, my first thoughts were, oh, for goodness sake, you know, between my mum and my sister, you had the funeral, he's been cremated, for goodness sake, pay the bloody bill, right? Yes. My first emotion was, for goodness sake. Yes. Frustration. Yeah. In, he died like, it's nearly a year. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right? Yes. Oh, dear. This was last night I got this. Uh, so was, I go to bed and Julie said, I said, you won't believe this. <laughs> and Julie put it into perspective perfectly. She said, well, it's what he would have wanted. He would have been so proud because he was such a cheap bugger <laughs> to think that he, that he got a free funeral at the very end. You know, like these, these people who are always late and you say, I bet they'll be late for their own funeral. Yeah. He was always cheap. And I bet he ended up having a funeral that doesn't get... He actually wouldn't care that he's on the shelf and he'd be more bothered that somebody paid for it. A fitting tribute, I suppose. A fitting tribute to a cheap man. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh dear. Yeah. Yeah. So, Aww. like I say, roller coaster of emotions there. Yeah. Oh, it sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs>